started. Um, I'm pleased to introduce our guest speaker today, well, guest, one of our faculty members who's spoken with us many times, um, Amani Wazwaz. Uh, Amani will be doing a series of lectures around this topic of the Houses of Wisdom, which she'll explain what the House of Wisdom is as part of the Mosaics grant the next year and a half. She's going to be exploring this topic and sharing um, her research. The Mosaics project is through our Fine and Performing Arts Center. It's done. It's going on with a grant from the National Endowment for the, from the Humanities. Is that right? The National um, American Performing Arts. American Performing Arts. OK, sorry about <laughs> okay. that. Uh, but it's an ongoing uh, grant that's looking at um, the Muslim experience, uh, Muslim culture in the US over time, and kind of opening up a conversation. And our library is very happy um, to be part of this conversation and to host a, a range of events, including this lecture today. So. Um, Amani has a PhD from Loyola in literature. She teaches uh, literature and composition. So for you students, keep an eye out for her. You definitely will want to take her classes. And with that, I'll turn it over. Thank you, Amani. Okay. Thank you all for being here. Welcome, everybody. It's great um, to have you here. Can you all hear me? OK, great. So uh, this is the title of my presentation, Translating, Preserving, and Creating New Knowledge, The Role of the House of Wisdom, Mosques, Schools, and Libraries. And Troy. <laughs> okay, flip it. Flip this. That should move. Aha, my fault. Okay. So this is the description for the presentation. And I want to zero in on the very first sentence, which is the following This interactive lecture introduces the value placed on libraries. Libraries, schools, mosques, houses of wisdom. But what I want to ask you is the stress is on libraries. So my librarians today, can you please stand? Who are the librarians? OK, please stand. So I've got Troy. OK, I've got some librarians in the back. And I've got some librarians here. And I've got a librarian hiding in front of me. And I've got a librarian here. So awesome. That's about eight librarians. You would have played a very special role 1,200 years ago in the Muslim world, and I will explain shortly. But first, let me ask you, you know, had we time traveled, you would have been like kings and queens, but why did you become a librarian? Let me ask you, why did you choose to become a librarian? And for the people who are not librarians, why in the world would you become a librarian? So I'll invite all of you into the discussion. We, we have one back here. OK, awesome. Um, uh, research and service. Research yes. and service. OK, research and service. That's one. What other one? I'm not a librarian yet. Yes. Librarians are the gatekeepers of okay. information. All right. So that's who you would go to if you want to find out anything. OK, so the gatekeepers of information serve the community, serve people, uh, gather information, research. OK, I have a more cliche answer in that I love to read, and I wanted to promote literacy and the importance of reading. OK, OK, awesome. You wanted to promote literacy and the importance of reading. And, and you yourself love reading. Who here loves reading? OK, all right, awesome. That's like 90% of us in, in the audience. That's amazing. Can I have at least two more responses? At least two more from a librarian and a lawn librarian. Why would a librarian, why would someone choose to be a librarian? Because we get to work with great faculty members. OK, all right. I like that. I like that answer tremendously. You get to work with great faculty members. I ask you the following. OK, before I actually move into that. So this is your role. You love reading. You love serving the community. You're a great keeper for information. You help people with, with research. This is what it means to you personally. But what about the actual? institution itself. What about libraries? What is their purpose? Now, this is for everybody, librarians and non-librarians. What is the purpose of having libraries in this world? 
Yes. It's a space where you can gain information. Okay, a space where you can find information. Don. To protect culture because libraries store culture. Okay. In yes. the books and the artifacts that they store. Yeah, it protects culture. Libraries protect culture, yes. Other roles that library, uh, libraries play besides protecting information, storing information, and protecting culture. What else do libraries do? What is their purpose? Yes. Okay, it's, it's a community place. It's a meeting place for communities to come together and to meet and to protect culture and to meet and to store information, protect culture. Okay, with that said, let me now test your knowledge. What are the two most ancient libraries? Could you please, those of you who have notebooks, could you please write your answers down? The two most ancient libraries are which ones? What are the two most ancient libraries? Yes. Uh, the Library of Alexandria. Yes. Okay, and what's the other one? Oak Lawn. Uh, Oak Lawn, okay. The library in Oak Lawn. How many of you are Oak Lawn residents? Okay, awesome. All right, yes, uh, Troy, maybe not that ancient, <laughs> okay. All right, the Library of Alexandria, it's true, but anybody have an idea what's the other one done? Okay. Um, okay. All right. I want to tell you, Tim Book Two is phenomenal. Just yesterday, I was reading. Like at one time, there were a hundred thousand residents, and twenty-five thousand were studying in the universities and libraries there. That is a house of wisdom culture, but that is for another lecture. There is one, Don, that's even older. Does anybody want to take a, a guess? Okay. I know you can't wait to hear, to see this. And it is the Assyrian Library of Nineveh. This is a very ancient library, very ancient library. And it was located in northern Iraq. And does anybody want to take a guess how it was unfortunately destroyed? This is how a lot of libraries are destroyed. Anybody take a guess? The same fate as the library in Assyria. How was it destroyed? OK. Um, you are talking, okay, you are talking, the Mongolians threw a lot of the knowledge in the river and, and it's, it's well known among the Arabic world that the river became blue with, with the ink. This was earlier. That was a very sad invasion and that was a very sad destruction of the culture, of Muslim culture. But before that, this is hundreds of years before that. It's not the invasion by Mongolians. What do you think? But that, that's a great point to bring up. It was by fire. It was by fire. But I want to tell you, um, I think it was Don who mentioned earlier, libraries are here to preserve culture. The culture that was documented in this library remained preserved. Can you guess why? How did they store their knowledge on this library? Assyria. Babylonians, Assyrians, where were their stories? Where was the knowledge being kept? Assyrians, Sumerians, yes. Okay, yes, yeah, there, it was all on clay tablets so that when it was burned, basically it just, everything hardened and we have stories from that culture. So thankfully, the knowledge that was kept here survived, even though the library wasn't. The fate was not that great when it came to the Library of Alexandria. It was different. This, too, was also burned in a fire. But where did they store their knowledge? Paper was not around yet. 
Yes, they were on papyrus scrolls, exactly. And that is why, unfortunately, the knowledge was basically wiped out. So these are the two libraries, uh, ancient libraries, just to give you a bit of a background before I go more into the Muslim culture. What I want to tell you is also this. There, there is now in Egypt the Bibliotheca Alexandrina, and they are building the library where it used to be before, which is absolutely phenomenal. This library is huge. It is designed to take as many books as possible. They're building it. I hope one day to visit it. This is how it looks on the outside, and this is how it looks on the inside. Just incredibly beautiful and truly well made. Okay, it brings us now into the topic of the discussion. Okay, so this was the history, a little bit of the history. I want to ask you this. Can a place of worship, a mosque, a synagogue, a church, a temple, can it be made into a library? Can it also be a library? Can a mosque, a place of worship, just in general, a church, also be a place of learning? You're shaking your heads. Okay. How many of you say yes? A lot of you say yes. Do you care to elaborate on this? <laughs> yes. Gentleman in the back. Uh, didn't, some, didn't some like ancient monasteries, weren't they usually like kept to keep, you know, ancient scrolls and like writings from the monks that were in the monasteries? Okay. It happened. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yes, okay, so it has happened, yes, in Asian culture. So for all of you, it doesn't feel strange, right, that a place of worship, does anybody want to give me another example besides the one that he gave? Yes, him and her. Mosques, mosques were the first place to learn in the exactly. Muslim culture. All right, you are definitely right. Mosques were the very first places where people gathered knowledge. And you wanted to answer as well too, right? Um, weren't colleges started originally like by Catholic communities? They were the, college, the original colleges. Okay, all right, so we see it in different cultures and in different communities. So Catholics, yes. Okay, so for the churches, they did have, um, they did have repositories of knowledge. For now, to bring it back to Muslim culture, yes, the mosque was the place of learning. I want to tell you something particularly special about Muslim culture. The, what is extremely prized, extremely, back then until this day, in Muslim cultures is what? What is it that is seen as extremely holy and sacred? What is that? What is it? The holy book, okay? The holy book, the Quran, is seen as very prized and very holy. Now, because of that, because it is revered, highly revered, books are also highly revered as well, too. And this is why, like the gentleman said in the back, the mosque became a library, it became an academy, it became a place of worship. So the mosque, you went there, to pray, but you also went there and you read books, and you also spoke with scholars, and you debated with them. It was, the mosque was a big, thriving center. It was a school. Mosques were schools. I want to ask you this. I want to tell you this. Mosque in Arabic. For those of you who know Arabic in the audience, what is the mosque in Arabic? Jamia, okay? It is Jamia. And you derive it, you take from the mosque, and you create the word university. What is the Arabic for university? Jamia. So the root is very much alike. So the place of worship, mosque, Jamia, becomes a place of gathering, Jamia. So you've got the male, mosque, Jamia. And the female form of it, jama'a, it's a place of gathering, it's a place of worship, it's a place to continue education. Mosques are very highly prized. 
From the mosque, you created the college. I want to ask you this. Take a look at this. And I want you to please use your psychic powers. What is it that you find is really interesting about this architectural structure over here? Psychic powers are telling you what? There's something that you're sensing that is extra special about this place. Yes. Okay. It has a huge area, and that huge area is for learning. Okay. Anything else you want to add on to this? Something that you notice. It has a huge area for learning. How, how would you describe it? What do you think? Do you want to be there? Is it comforting? Is it interesting looking? What other adjectives would you use to describe it? Don, what would you just, yes? Okay. I think there are so many goals. I think for students and for students. Okay. Inside the hall is an overall. Okay. Yeah. As a model besides the other rooms. Okay. Besides the architect. Right. Amazing. Yes. Because it's a moral. Right. Oh, this is very nice. Okay. And this will help me. All right. And that is an absolutely beautiful imagination that you imagine a circle of students gathered around their teacher and they're learning and they're learning in a very pleasant environment, right? Yes. Okay. I hear you. Okay, and I can easily envision what is going on in your mind. I want to tell you something else that makes this structure even more special. Let me show you more sides to this place. Okay, so the pleasantness that you're envisioning, look, there is more to it. There are more sides to this place, okay? I want to tell you the following. What makes Al Karawin very, very special are the things that you just mentioned. The architecture, it's special. It has gathered plenty of students, students revolving around a teacher. What is wonderful is it started out as a mosque. It's a mosque university. It's one of the oldest universities in the world, and it started out as a mosque. What makes it? Super special is, it's founded by a woman, okay? This woman got this, Fatima Fihri, got all of this inheritance from her father, and she said, I'm going to do good with it, and what I'm going to do is, I am going to build a mosque. And when she started building it, she started fasting. And she said, I'm not going to stop my fasting until it's done. And then it gathered a lot of people, and the people were learning. And this place continues to exist as of this day and age. So Fatima Fihri founded the very first uh, mosque university in the world. Any responses to this fact? What do you think? I have, I have my own, but I'd like to hear, to hear from you. Okay. Uh, women are not restricted in Islam. Yeah. Do you want to add more to that? Contrary to popul popular belief. Okay. All right. And uh, does anybody else want to add to this? Okay, Troy, there's somebody in the back. To this day, I have like a lot of friends named Fatima, like that, or maybe named after her. 
Okay, that could be it. That could also be because uh, the Prophet, the Prophet Muhammad's daughter is all Fatima. So it could be inspired by her. It could be inspired by the Prophet's daughter as well too. Can I hear from somebody else also in, in, the, in the audience? Okay, I want to tell you, I find it remarkable for the very same reason that you mentioned. The popular stereotype is women in Islam are very restricted. They cannot do anything. They cannot be educated. And this, this shows the remarkable accomplishment that Fatima did. It really does. In the mosques, not only boys, but little girls went to learn. So this is amazing to my mind. I want to ask you, uh, the young woman in red, she was saying that she imagined students coming together and learning under uh, the leadership of this particular scholar. It's very true. This is what happened in mosques. People gather together around a particular scholar to listen to this person. Uh, about five years ago, I went to Jerusalem, and I went to the mosque there, and I saw the very same thing. A group of women were gathered around a teacher, listening to her and gathering information. And this is what they did. I want to tell you, look closely at the picture. The teacher, what is, where is he sitting, and where are the students sitting? You see the difference? Well, to me, it looks like he's sitting in a throne. And okay. The students are beneath, like at his feet. Right, yes. So it would kind of, I, I think it kind of signifies the wisdom imparted from him to them. Okay, yes. He's sitting on a, on a throne, on a chair, and they're sitting on the ground. It lives on in our language now because. The head of the department is who? What do we call the head of the department? Chair. chair, exactly. So we call the head of the department the chair. And maybe perhaps it comes from that time. And it has lived through, you know, through our age. You said it shows his knowledge and his wisdom. Can you please, the librarians here, can you please share with us, how long did it take you to get your degree? Masters, PhD, what, whichever degree that you have. Care to share? No? Okay. <laughs> Troy? Uh, I don't know, 10 or 15, depend on all the way through, it was like 15 years. Okay. For me, give or take. Okay, all the way through from the start to the finish, 15 years. Maria? Probably, probably a similar amount. Similar, okay. Anybody else? Any other librarian? Rebecca? Half of that, okay. I hear you. It takes a long time, right, to become a scholar. In the Muslim world, between 10 to 20 years to get your doctorate, between 10 to 20 years to be recognized as a scholar, you had to study, and you had to study tremendously. And at the end of studying, you wrote what was called the Risana. Risana is a letter. And you defended it pretty much like what we do right now. You wrote, you went to the mosque, and you spoke, and you talked about your research and your findings. And you were given a chair. And you could now teach other scholars as well, too. I find it very interesting that there is that concept of the chair which lives on into our world. This now takes me into how we started with the House of Wisdom. The mosques were places of learning. This is where students gathered. Only those who were highly skilled and highly knowledgeable could teach. And then in, uh, the, in the ninth century in Iraq, there came these caliphs, or Muslim leaders, and they started collecting books. And there was the caliph al-Ma'mun. 
His grandfather loved books, and so did his father, Harun al Rashid. And then Caliph Ma'mun came into this world, and he started ruling over Baghdad. And in the year 819, he came to Baghdad, and he started looking and seeking for knowledge. He had a dream that he, had, uh, he saw Aristotle, and he started going all over the world. And he said, I wanted to bring all, I want to bring all the books from all over the world into one place. And I want, when you bring this, uh, this book, these books, I would like to translate them into Arabic because Arabic was the official language of the Abbasid Empire back in the day. His dream was people would gather together and they would debate with one another. They would learn and have intelligent debates. His dream came true. He was able to get many, many books into one place, and he was able to inspire a lot of debates among scholars. This is what he said. It's not just that you read a book, but you read it and you do something with it. So this was the start of the House of Wisdom, or Beit al-Hikmah. And I want to ask you the following. So he wanted to gather books. Can you please pause for a minute? Where would he bring these books from? Can you please write down in your notes, for those of you who have notebooks, write down in your notes at least three different places. Where do you think he was gathering knowledge from? He was sending out all of these people to get books and knowledge from where? OK. Troy. I'll say Greek. Yes, yes. A lot of knowledge from Greece, yes. Um, from India and Persia. Definitely, yes, exactly. From India and from Persia, from, okay, Greece, okay, ancient Greek knowledge, from India and from Persia. Any other places? These are really big ones, class, a class, audience. <laughs> Any other places? Greece, India, Persia, absorbed tremendous knowledge from there, Don. Yes, there is a lot of dialogue and conversation from the kings of Timbuktu and people in Mecca. Tremendous conversation uh, and giving back of knowledge between these cultures, yes. Other places. So these are very key areas. Uh, they would bring in books from Greece, from India, from Persia. So if you knew more than two, more than one language, you really had it made back in the day. I want you to take a guess. How much money would the king or the caliph give you if you would translate a book? Can you take a guess? What your salary would be in one month? You it seems like you want to take a guess. No? OK. Anybody want to take a guess? Yes? What is it? it? It will translate it into current one. You want to take a guess? What is it? But, but how much the equivalent of how much to American dollars? What is it? Okay, you are the first one ever to be so close. $40,000 a month, a month. If you knew more than one language and could translate these ancient Greek texts to Arabic, and yeah, oh my God, that is awesome. Like for a month, you were treated like royalty. You were part of the house of wisdom. Everything, everything was great for you and your family. $40,000, it is absolutely a lot. So if you knew Arabic and Greek, or if you knew uh, Hindi and Arabic, or um, the Persian language and Arabic, that is absolutely amazing. So $40,000, the equivalent of today's money. This culture really prized learning and translation. I want to ask you, 
when you translate, what is it exactly that you do? Do you take the Arabic and switch it to, I mean, do you take the Greek and switch it to Arabic? Do you take the English and switch it to Arabic? Or is more involved? Oh, can you elaborate, please? Okay, so you, you want to try your best to take the essence of a, con of a concept, right? Okay, try to lift up the concept as much as possible. What else is involved in, in the art of translating? Don? They don't. Oh, exactly. So language is culture, and a big part of the culture is embedded in the language. Like, take, for example, this. Those of you who know Arabic, <laughs> all right, <laughs> OK. Um, in Arabic, it's good, right? In Arabic, it makes perfect sense. But you translate it to English, sale of chicken murder, you know? I mean, that's exactly what they're trying to communicate. But you got to have, you got to know the culture, and you got to make sure you're translating properly. Can all of you please write this down? And the people, the Arabic uh, speaking folks in the audience, please withhold this. Um, there is an amazing, amazing uh, expression in Arabic. Tu'burni. And in English, you bury me. Can you please write it down? You bury me. And I want you to take a guess. What am I telling you? You bury me. You bury me. You bury me. Yes. In what way? Okay, you're almost there. You're almost there. You bury me. Does anybody else want to add on to what she's saying? You bury me, you. Okay. I like you so much. I hope I die and that you bury me before you die. That's what it means. It's actually an expression of love. That's what it is. You bury me. So if you didn't know the culture and you just said, you bury me, it's like, what? I want to give you another one, all right? OK, Arabic speakers in the audience, please withhold this. Uh, but inta mahdoom, inti mahdoome. OK, non-Arabic speakers. You are digestible. You are digestible. So what are you going to say? What does that mean? Take a minute and think about it. You are digestible. OK, what do you think? That's awesome. Yeah, yes, you are really cute. You are easygoing. And that's why you are digestible, yes. So there is an art to translating. It is not easy. You need to know the culture like Don said. OK, so I want to say this. Did the scholars working during the time of Muslim civilization, did they just translate? You took the Greek book and changed it to Arabic. You took the Persian book and changed it to Arabic. Because uh, the gentleman in the back was saying there is a stereotype about Muslim women being weak and being restricted. Well, there is also a huge stereotype about translation. What did they do? Did they just translate or what? Some of you are like, no, they did more. Then what did they do? They did a lot, and that's why silence reigns. They did so much with the translation. Can you give me at least three, re three things that they did with the translations? OK, I'm going to help you with this one. 
Unfortunately, our world says all Muslims did was take books and translate it, and that was it. They were custodians of knowledge. They prevented ancient knowledge from disappearing. They did prevent it from disappearing, and that's absolutely awesome. But that is not the only thing that they did. With time, they perfected the art of translation. The more they learned Greek, the more they learned Persian, the more that they would take the Arabic and the Persian and add on to it, and they would make a better and stronger copy. What would they do when they would translate? The houses of wisdom, the mosques, were packed with books. The house of wisdom was developing. There were a lot of books, but the house of wisdom was also a learning academy, which meant that people were discussing the knowledge that was in them and adding on to it. They were taking Greek knowledge, Greek science, and shucking it. And this is phenomenal, because it's not always that people did that. Take a science and shuck it. This is what science is all about. Scholars during the Muslim age did um, had the scientific process going on where they took ideas and they said, the Greeks said this, is it true or is it not? They checked it over and over again and they created other types of knowledge. So they did not stop. It was not just translation for translation's sake. And I wanna tell you, there is um, this phenomenal Christian uh, scholar who lived under the Muslim Empire and he was a great translator, Hunayn ibn Ishik. There were a lot of these translators who were Christian and they worked in the Muslim Empire. That's something that I also want to stress today that in the Muslim Empire, not everybody was Muslim. It was a very multi-ethnic community the very fact that they were so willing to look at the cultures and the knowledge from different people is something that, pe that in our day and age we take for granted. Back then this was something phenomenal, what they did, to bring the ideas of the Greeks uh, and people from Timbuktu and bring it all together and talk about it. That is amazing. What is also amazing was the people working were coming in from different faiths. There were Jewish Arabs, there were Christians from different lands, there were people who had no faith. They were talking, they were discussing things. Hunayn was a phenomenal translator, but he was also very interested in the medical sciences as well too, and so was his son. There's another great one. There is a great um, philosopher and thinker, al Jahid. In two weeks' time, I will be part of a play where I will be a student, and there is another professor here by the name of Jason King. Does anybody know him? Okay, Jason King will play the part of al Jahid. And al Jahid means what? What does it mean? <laughs> the one whose eyes are sticking out, okay? He was incredible. He wrote 300 books in his lifetime because what did he do? He went around the world and he observed the animal kingdom and he noticed, oh my God, dogs and wolves and foxes, they look so much alike and their behavior is so much alike, which means they must have a common grandparent. He wrote all of these observations. He looked at animal behavior and just wrote and wrote and he went to mosques and he got into arguments with philosophers and and he made fun of the people who frequented the mosques. He was a very engaged writer. He was just absolutely am am amazing. He was also part of the House of Wisdom culture. More people from the House of Wisdom, Muhammad, Ahmad, and Hassan Bani Musa, were, also, were three brothers. Uh, their father unfortunately died, but Caliph al Ma'mun took good care of them and brought them into the palace and took very good care of them and had tutors to teaching them. They made it on their own. They started asking people to translate for them. They were engineers. They were mathematicians. They developed ingenious devices. Okay. 
And these are one of their uh, inventions they wrote and developed. There was even more. Here is more, more of their devices. Um, Muhammad bin Musa was, um, he proposed the idea that the moon and the planets were subject to laws of physics just like the Earth. So he had a very interesting idea ahead of his time. For the next year and a half, I will be talking about taking these different scholars and talking about them one by one. Like Al-Jahid, I will have a whole play all about him. And for Al-Khawarizmi, I will have a whole play on him as well too. Jason King is going to also be a part of this play. Al-Khawarizmi developed the concept of quadratic equations. He also refined numbers. He set in motion a lot of the ideas to make inheritance laws, to make algebraic uh, laws much more easier to handle. So al-Khawarizmi, al-Jahid, there were so many different scholars. It's going to take me a year and a half to go through them. This was my introductory lecture today to introduce how I am especially honored that Troy accepted for this lecture to be in the library because it pretty much this is where it started. It started with honoring books, it started with honoring learning, and then it spread, and it spread tremendously. And this is the image of the scholar. And I want you to take a look at this image because this is the culture that thrived, that loved books, that wanted to seek so much knowledge and information and add on to it. Would, do you have any questions for me? Any questions? It will be in the fine arts. It will be on uh, Learning College Day. And I will, uh, Jason King will be Al Jahid, and I will be Talib or his student. Okay, okay awesome. <laughs> that is awesome. And, and then he'll be Al Khawarizmi, and I'll also be his student as well, too. Other questions? Troy. I, I would just make a comment that. In our, I think our curriculum in some ways is guilty of this, that the Western curriculum moves from ancient Greece and then all of a sudden we show up in Renaissance Europe. Yeah. And yes. 500 years of scholarship is left out. Exactly. And so if you think of someone like Thomas Aquinas, who's you know a premier Christian scholar in the 1300s, 1400s, he knew people like Avicenna, Averroes, yes. leading Muslim scholars who kept Aristotle and Plato alive and didn't just translate but added deep ideas that continue that conversation. And so when they were understanding how the world worked as philosophers in the 1300s, 1400s, they were in communication with that line of Western tradition and that is often left out for many reasons that we can explore later um, right. in our stories. And yeah. so I think um, that's something that I'm glad we're able to host this because it helps to build that more complete picture of, of philosophy and thought and um, how progress is actually made. So thank you for doing this. And, and, okay. I, and other, are there other questions besides just right. that comment? And, and Troy, thank you so much you know, for bringing that up. Uh, I thought of bringing it up and then I'm like, no, I, I better not because it's, it's a very touchy topic and, and it shouldn't be. There, is, there are so many historical documents that show the House of Wisdom, Bayt al-Hikmah, existed. This was a thriving culture, but uh, a lot has happened to erase this history. And even in this day and age, a lot continues to go on uh, that doubt this history. But this history exists. And as much as people try you know, to say, no, it's not true, it's, it's not great, there are a lot of evidences that it, it existed. And it does make a big difference if we acknowledge it. There's now a book called Lost History that, cov that covers all of this. So Troy, thank you for bringing that up. And I'm really glad that I'm being given the opportunity at Moraine to have these various lectures. Like I told you, there will be like 12 to 16 in a year and a half between like 
plays and interactive lectures. Like um, for Learning College Day, I'm going to cover those two plays. I'm also going to cover uh, as well hospitals in medieval Islam as well too. Yes. Any comments? Any questions? How many of you are uplifted by the idea of the House of Wisdom, of there being a learning academy that is a library, a research center, and a place of learning where you talk with other scholars like yourselves? How many of you are uplifted by this? A show of hands. Okay. All right. I love this idea as well, too. Any comments? Any questions? Something that's going on in your mind. Troy, should we end it? Sounds good. Okay, okay thank you. have a great day, everybody. Applause.